Okay, let's start. Um, let me share my screen with you real quick. So, if everything works out, you should see my screen. So, an official hello and a welcome to the free workshop on intuition behind computer networks, which is brought to you by Code Labs Academy and held by me. Um, my name is Devram, and I work as a cybersecurity instructor at Code Labs Academy. I received my bachelor's degree in cognitive science from the University of Osnabrück in Germany, and my master's degree in data science and cybersecurity from the EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. Before we dive right in, um, let me take a few minutes to talk to you about who we are and who's sponsoring this, this workshop. What is Code Labs Academy really about? Oh, okay, my bad. Give me a second. There, is that better? I hope so. Perfect. Um, thank you, too. So, who are we? We are Code Labs Academy, and we're a team of 22 um, colleagues from, from across the globe, with our open campus being located in Berlin and Germany. Um, we are an international educational tech startup. That means we offer boot camps that are technological in nature. And our goal with these boot camps is to have a boot camp that is accessible to anybody, no matter your background. Next to that, we also offer educational and career advising services to help students break into the tech industry. And um, if you're interested, when I talk about our, our options, we offer different financing plans that I'll talk to you about in a second. Um, the, the courses and the boot camps that we offer can be either in person or remotely taught. They can be taught part-time or full-time. Um, the idea is that it fits your plan, right? Finally, if you have doubts about not having the, the necessary prerequisites, the way we design these workshops is that the first two weeks, basically before the workshop even starts, we'll distribute material and help you get to the same base by what we call pre-work weeks. So if you're interested about what I'm going to talk about, we have different financing options that you find here. You can back, go back to the slides at the end to see what works for you. Um, we have different discounts. For example, for attending the workshop, you get a 10% discount if you want to. Um, finally, one big thing that we have right now is that in November, uh, you get 1,000 euro discounts just for registering for the courses I'm about to show you now. So the upcoming boot camps uh, are these. Um, we have four different kinds of them. So we have a data science one, a UX, UI one, a web development bootcamp, and a cybersecurity bootcamp. So these all start on January 9th, this upcoming year, and can either be done hybrid in Berlin, which would be full-time over the duration of three months, or remotely, which start at, the, uh, start at the 11th of January, which can be done remotely in a part-time setting, right? So 20 hours per week. Um, before we start off, the last thing, the free workshop like this is done by ONS a lot, a lot as you can see. Um, these are the next ones that are in the topic of cybersecurity. Um, so we have intro to cybersecurity on this, this Sunday. We have Docker Security Part 1 that is done next Sunday um, in, in December. And the first part you can find on YouTube. And at the end of this year, we will have a, a workshop on different encryption ciphers and more. So have a look at our website or Eventbrite and um, check it out. Maybe you find something that is interesting to you. So let's start off with, with the topic at hand. Um, what, are, what am I going to talk about, right? What is my goal? Why am I doing this workshop? The setting that I want to give you an intuition in, that's what the title is about, is, is this, right? So you have a browser and you enter www.coldlabsacademy.com. And as you may know, something like this may pop up, right? The website loads and you have what you want. But did you ever ask yourself what really happens here, right? What happens behind the scenes? How does this work? So we know that some kind of communication must take place, but which kind of communication? How does it work? What kind of messages get sent? What do messages look like, right? So we are going to talk about that. I want to give you an idea about what the messages look like and the communication between a computer and a server, for example. How can we send things? How are things routed? How do things know how they route what, right? Um, this is the goal of my presentation. And um, what you will hopefully learn at the end is how addressing works in networks nowadays. So we will talk about IP addresses, MAC addresses, and ports. 
we will talk about how devices know where to send packets, so basically routing, and there are the protocols that we're going to talk about, the ARP, IPv4, and DNS. We will also talk about how computer networks are modeled and how the responsibility of them is distributed by looking at the two most common models. So this is the TCP IP model and the OSI model. And we'll also mention what kind of hardware devices are used to make networking possible in the first place, right? So routers and switches would be the, the topics here. The layout of this presentation is that we will start out with the basics um, and then we will have the network models. Finally, at the end, we will have a quiz and an exercise that you can take home and uh, do on your own, where we will provide solutions to check how well you understood everything. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask those in the chat. Um, my, my colleagues Priyanka and Emil will hopefully be able to help you. And yeah, let's dive right in. Um, so let's talk about the basics. So the first thing we're going to talk about are MAC and IP addresses. And the reason we're doing so is because we have to start from somewhere. The computer network field is very interconnected. And I think a first stepping stone, a nice stepping stone is MAC and IP addresses. So you have to understand when we talk about computer networks, a nice comparison in the real world for this kind of communication is something like a post system, right? So um, you have someone that's trying to send something to a receiver. Um, you have a system that makes this communication possible with the post system, right? And if you think in this kind of um, in this kind of world, right, you will need addresses right? because we have to be able to differentiate different persons. How would I be able to get any letter if I wouldn't have an address? So the addresses that you will see on the internet are um, very diverse, but the two main ones, if I would say so, are the MAC address and the IP address. So let's start off with the MAC address. The MAC address is, um, is an abbreviation for media access control, and it's also known as the physical address. So why is it the physical address? Basically, every device that you have that is capable of kind of wireless or wired communication computer networks, that might be a computer, a mobile phone, Bluetooth headsets, everything, has this MAC address. And it was hard-coded by, by the manufacturer, right? So this address is given by to the device by the manufacturer when it is created. And uh, it's usually static. So what do I mean by that? A static address is that we can't really change it theoretically. Um, there are tricks to, to represent a different MAC address, but generally the MAC address is a static address. So it's given once and it stays this. Um, so we will have this very nice differentiation between local networks and non-local networks. And we'll talk about that on the next few slides. But what you need to understand is that a MAC address is used when you want to talk to machines locally. Okay. Um, the address format that you will see with MAC address is this kind of string where Xs represent hexadecimal numbers. And if you do take this and calculate, you will see that the MAC address has 48 bits. So that means we have two to the power of 48 possible addresses. Now, the, the other side is the IP address. So if we try to contrast them, right, because I think contrasting makes a lot of sense in this context, um, the IP address stands for the Internet Protocol address. It's the Internet address. So this is this is not a physical address, but, but it's... That's the one that you use if you are traveling or, or communicating on the internet. It's dynamic. What that means is, is it's not given by you um, to your device by the manufacturer or anything, but rather it's assigned to you. So who is assigning these kind of addresses? Well, that would be your internet service provider, right? For example, in Germany, it could be something like Vodafone or T-Mobile. And these, these internet service providers, they bought a lot of IP addresses and their job is basically to rent them out to different people. And um, so they can assign me one IP address right now, but tomorrow it might be a different one, right? I don't notice this, but the IP address is assigned. It's not static, right? That's the contrast that we want to see. Um, when I told you the MAC address is used in this local network, the IP address is, is the complement to that. So it's used in the global network. But we'll talk about that in a second a bit more. The address format looks like this. So it's four X's. What does X mean? I'll talk about in a second. Um, separated by three dots. And each, each X represents an integer between 0 and 255. So again, if you calculate this, this is 32 bits. Right? So it's a 32-bit address. That means we have 2 to the power of 32 possible addresses. So I talked to you about networks. But what is a network? 
Well, the most simple definition that will suffice for what we want to do right now is that a network is a group of two or more connected computers or a network capable devices, right? And I talked to you about a local network and this global network. And this is what we're going to contrast now. So the next contrast we have is um, looking at a LAN. So I, maybe you heard this word, but what it stands for is a local area network, okay? So um, a LAN network or LAN is nothing else but a network, so connected devices that are contained within a small geographic area, like a building, right? So if you have computers that are very close and closely connected, if it's at home or a company, a small company, and all of them are connected, we talk about a LAN network, right? So um, company networks or home Wi-Fi networks, all of this is LAN. Um, if you're on a LAN network, how do you get connection to the internet? Well, that happens through a single centralized point usually, especially if you look at home networks, that is a router, right? And we'll talk about a router as well. So the, the connection that happens in LANs is often done by either ethernet, so wired approach or Wi-Fi, um, so wireless approach, right? And if what we can contrast the local area network with is the wide area network. So that's the, the other side of the coin, if you want. So um, while the local area network is responsible for connecting devices in a close geographical area, the wide area network is responsible for connecting devices over large distances, right? So the most common example that you will find is the internet. So the internet is connecting devices all over the world, which is why it's a wide area network, okay? And an important thing that you need to understand is that the wide area network is nothing else but a collection of many, many, many connected local area networks. But we'll talk about that in a second as well. The last thing before we get a bit more explicit and out of this theory is switches and routers. So switches and routers are both pieces of hardware that are used in networks to connect devices. So let's talk about the switch first. So a switch is basically only used in LANs. And um, it is used to connect devices within a LAN. So it's responsible for forwarding and, um, and relaying um, messages between connected devices using the MAC address. So you see the switch um, and the MAC address are very important when you talk about local area networks. Okay, that's what I want you to remember. Um, the next thing that we have is a router. So a router can be used in a LAN but also at a, in a WAN, right? So a wide area network as well. And it is used not to connect devices in a LAN, but rather to connect different local area networks to each other. Um, it's also responsible for forwarding relaying packets, but in contrast to the switch, it doesn't really care about the MAC address, but rather cares about the IP address, okay? So what that means is that routers are not necessarily directly connected, but we'll see that visually in a second as well. Um, but rather they, the, the messages are passed between routers through the lines. So this is a lot of theory. Let's talk about how, how to, we can visualize this, right? Um, this is an example network. So we have three computers here, A, B, and C. And we have two switches, which are the rectangular boxes that you see in the middle. And on the top right, we have a router. And um, the, the lines connect, um, connecting different devices are connections, right? And what I also wrote down here are the MAC addresses of the computers A, B, and C. So the, the thing I wanna to talk to you about and show you now is how communication happens within a LAN network. So let's imagine that computer A wants to send a packet to computer C, right? So it prepares a packet and what it needs to do in order for this packet to arrive anywhere is to write down addresses on it, right? That makes sense if we compare it to a letter. So we'll write the address that it comes from and the address that it's supposed to go. So the MAC source address and the MAC destination address. As a source, we'll write its own MAC address. And as a destination, we'll write the MAC address of, the, of computer C. It will finish this packet up and send it on a merry way to the first switch. The first switch receives this packet we'll see, okay, this packet is coming from A um, with this MAC address, and it's supposed to go to this MAC address, which uh, corresponds to C. Um, switches know, because the switch has three possible output pathways for, for a packet like this, it will know, okay, for this packet to arrive where it's supposed to be, I need to send it to the right, right? in this case, to the other switch. Um, the switch then forwards this package to the next one. This 
uh, the switch does the same. It looks at the MAC destination. And it's like, okay, this, um, this message has to go to computer C, which is on my self interface, so to the bottom, and we'll send it to C. C will then see, well, I'm the destination of this packet and receive it and open it. Okay. So <clears throat> important thing in local area networks is that you have MAC addresses. They play a role and switches play a role, right? They're responsible for getting, getting the packets, looking at them and deciding where they have to go, right? And so we talked about having different LANs and what, what I said previously is that a wide area network is nothing else but a connection of multiple local area networks, right? And how, how they connected through routers. So if we have a look um, at a second example, which is a tiny bit more complicated, but will perfectly round up what we talked about up until now. Um, it is that we have six computers in this case, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. Each of them has a MAC address that is written down. In, so for example, computer A has MAC address all A's, B, C's, D's, and so on and so forth. The difference is now that we also include IP addresses, right? So we have, for example, computer A has IP address 1111, and uh, computer E has 333.1. And so each computer has a MAC and IP address. And this is what you see in the real world. What else do we have here? Well, we have switches again, free switches. But this time, we also have two routers um, that are connecting all these three different LANs, right? So because what we see is, the computers on the left, A and B, together with their switch, they build a local area network. Computers D and C with their switch build a local area network. And the ones on the right, computer E and F with their switch build a local area network. And all of these local area networks are connected through these two routers that we see, right? And the interesting thing is that you need to understand is that each router has uh, an IP address and a MAC address as well, but not only one, but one for each local area network that it's connected to. So for example, if we look at this left router here, it has IP address 1115 for the local area network on its left, but 2225 for its local area network on its right, okay? It also has a MAC address that works in the same fashion. So now that we hopefully understood the basic idea, let's look at what happens if we send a message. So again, we want A to send a message, and this time A wants to send a message to F to make a very long path and for us to understand what's going on. It will again write addresses down. So it starts with its MAC source address. It tells us, well, the MAC source address of this packet is me, and this is my MAC address, right? Um, it will write down the IP source address. So it writes down my IP address is 1111. I'm sending this packet. So, and now we come into the interesting part. Um, I told you that MAC addresses are very related to local area networks, while IP addresses are related to these wide area networks. We know that the packet at the end has to get to F, right? And this is what happens over the wide area network, which is why the IP destination address for this packet will be the one that we see on computer F. However, because A and F are not in the same local area network, A doesn't, isn't able to use the MAC address of F, of computer F, right? If they were in the same, same um, local area network, they can make use of this, this mechanism, but they can't. Instead, A needs to use the MAC address of the device in its local area network that is basically the intermediary point for the packet to get, get from A to F. Right, so in this case, we see if A wants to get the packet to F, it will need to go over the router with the IP address 11115. And so for this reason, um, A will write the MAC destination address of this router because it's the last device in its own local area network before leaving its own lo local area network and entering a new one, okay? So this is why the MAC destination address has to be the one of this router. But, and this is the important thing, the IP address is the global one, right? The IP address, the destination for that will always be the final goal. So in this case, free, 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 free. So let, what, what happens? So A writes this um, kind of addressing. 
it sends the packet into the network. The switch looks at the MAC addresses. It says, well, the destination is the router on my right. It will forward this packet to the, to the router. So now something very interesting happens. So what does this router see? The router sees, well, this comes from a computer A with the, this MAC and this IP address, and it's supposed to go to IP address 33333. However, if this router is, keep, uh, is going to keep forwarding this packet, suddenly it's, leave, it's leaving the first LAN, so the first local area network, and it's entering the second area net, local area network. That means the MAC addresses that we that were used previously are irrelevant, right? Because these were specific to the local area network this packet is coming from. Now, since, since it's entering this middle local area network, we need to replace them. So in this local area network, we have, let's make this again clear, we have five devices, right? We have computers D and C, a switch, and two routers. The packet needs to go from the first router to the second router and then needs to be forwarded again. For this reason, the MAC addresses get, get replaced by the following two. So this router will replace the source MAC address by its own because it's the first device and the source in this new local area network in the middle. And it will put in as a MAC destination address the, the last device that's on the route that's still in this local area network, right? So this router right here. Um, this is done. So now the packet is thrown into this local area network and it makes sense now because the MAC addresses are from this local area network. The switch will know, okay, this comes from my left. It has to go to this MAC address, which is on my right, forwards it to the router. The router takes a look again. And we have the same situation as before. This packet is coming from one local area network and is entering a new local area network. So the MAC addresses have to be replaced. In this right local area network, the destination is the computer F. And from a local area network perspective, the source is the router that we see on the right here. So it will replace the source MAC address by its own and write as the MAC destination address the one from computer F finally now, because finally this computer is in the local area network that we're looking for. So this gets sent to the switch and finally it gets forwarded to computer F um, by the switch. So the important thing, and this might be a bit complicated, but this is all that happens really. The important thing is that from start to the goal, the IP addresses are the ones that you would expect. So computer A's IP address is the IP source and computer's F IP address is the destination. And that doesn't change at all. But while this packet traverses through different local areas, enters new ones and leaves, leaves old ones, the MAC addresses always change when it enters a new local area network, right? And this is done by the routers. Why? Because the MAC addresses are specific, specific to the local area networks that they are in. So if I have MAC addresses in one local area network and I enter a new one, they become irrelevant, irrelevant, sorry, irrelevant. And I have to adjust to the new local area network I'm at. Okay, I hope this is somewhat clear. Um, let's keep on. So the next topic we're looking at is network models. And what is a network model? So a network model is a, is a way to to make an abstract representation of how networks work, right? Um, so the ones that you will always see make use of what is called layers. And um, these layers are shown here. So we have five different layers, um, physical data link network, transport and application layer. And the idea is that basically the computer networks work on a certain way, right? Um, we wanna basically separate different responsibilities. So this is where this layered approach comes from. For example, the, the layer with number one, the physical layer, is everything that is responsible, uh, has to do with, with physical things, um, with raw bits, for example. While the layer on the very top is the application layer, that has to do with the applications that you work with. So basically, we look at everything that happens and we assign everything to a certain layer to have this um, distribution of responsibility. Okay, so the five layers, like I told you, are physical data link network transport and application layer. And for the next time, we'll, for, for this time now, we will go through them 
and try to understand them. Um, one second, I think there's a question. Let me see. So how are IP addresses assigned? Sometimes they see a different one locally than on the internet. Thank you for the question, Angela. Sometimes I see a different one locally than on the internet. Okay. Um, let me talk about that. So this is a bit in depth, but I tell you the difference. Basically, there isn't only one IP address. There are, so what you would like to know, okay, I'll start off like this, Angela. What you would like to know is if I have a packet to, for a computer, right? Um, it would be nice to know whether this, this computer is in my local area network or outside of it, right? Because then I basically know if, whether it has to go out of the out of my local area network from one computer uh, from one local area network to the next into the internet, or whether it is inside. For this reason, computers usually, like if you look at your home network, don't have only one IP addresses but two or more. So there's this one that you that you know called the regular, maybe if I read correctly, the regular internet address, right? The IP address. That's the one that's assigned by your ISP. But then there's a second set of IP addresses, which are called local IP addresses. They often start with 192 dot something or 10 dot something. And these are the ones that are only used in your local area network. So if you want to write to a computer in your local area network, you're not going to use the, the IP address that is assigned from something that's outside of it, right? In your local area network, you, want, you don't want to be dependent on anything outside of it. Since you will always need an IP address to send something to a computer, but you don't want to be um, basically dependent on IP addresses that are assigned outside of it, there's the second set of IP addresses, like I told you, those local IP addresses that are only used inside of your local area network. This is what you see. You will always see, uh, for example, my computer right now has one that starts with 192 dot something, something, something. This address is only used by other computers and devices on, on my home network that will want to communicate with me. For everything that's outside of this local, so outside of my home, basically, they need to use my official IP address, right? This outside exterior IP address. Is that clear? I'll just assume it's clear. If not, you'll throw me another message, okay? Because, so next question is, why do you need to have a local IP address if you have a MAC address? Because packets usually, as we will see at the end, I think this might be clearer at the end, but just to give you an idea, because, um, slides again because the packet structure relies on the fact that there needs to be an IP address because that's the way that the packet is built so you need some type of IP address um, and if so I see your point right why do you need an IP address if I wouldn't need an IP address I wouldn't use this local IP address that's true but because the way the packet structure is built and it's supposed to be generic right um, you need to have some IP address. And in that case, if you want to write to a computer that's on your local area network, you want to use this local IP address. I hope that's clear. I'll continue from here if you don't have any it's it's some type of redundancy exactly angela i'll continue for it so we were stopped at network models which again we use network models to somehow make an abstraction of what we see just to have a basically separation of different responsibilities um so the two network models that you will always hear about <clears throat> are osi and tcp ip and we will talk about them at the end. I don't want to talk about them now. Why? This is what you can see right here, right? These five layers. This is a custom model. I made myself if you want to. I mean, I wrote it down, right? That's what's making a model is like then in that case. 
Um, but I chose this because I think it's really nice to go through these, this kind of model to understand what's happening. At the end, I'll show you the OSI and TCP IP model, and there's very few differences between what we see there and what we will learn with now, okay? So we will also, while we talk about these, um, uh, these different layers, we will also talk about some protocols like DNS, HTTP, TCP and UDP, and ARP. And um, one interesting thing that you should know is basically that the way I also represented here, it's a bottom up kind of model where the, the lower the number of a layer is, right? The lower it is to the bottom, the closer to hardware it is. And the higher it is, like the application layer, the more abstract it gets. And it's more about data, right? So the physical layer, as you will see, is about bits on a cable. And the application layer is really about, for example, WhatsApp messages. It's very different. This, this is the kind of thing that we will go through now. And we'll start with the very basic layer. So we'll start with the physical layer and work our way up to the application layer. Um, so the physical layer. So the physical layer is the first layer and it's responsible for actual transmission and reception of raw bits over physical media. So what does that mean? Um, just for you to understand, I'll start each, I start each layer with this kind of characterization slides. We just have a one sentence introduction. Um, but what I want to say is basically, if a device A wants to send a bit, like a one or a zero to any device B, the physical layer is the, the layer that's really responsible for taking care that this happens correctly and that, that it happens in the first place. That's its main function. Um, for this reason, it needs, it's also very close to the cables, right? Um, because it's transmitting electrical signals. Um, so it also describes what kind of cable standards need to be in place, um, like Ethernet, the power lines, the radio signals, telephone lines, everything. That's also all related to the physical layer. And if I had to give you an understanding of the physical layer in a visual form, I would do it like this. So if I have a computer, uh, A, and a computer B, they're connected through cable. When So everything that we do on a computer can be represented in a, in a binary form, right? By bits, ones, and zeros. And when a message is sent from A to B, at one point, the computer needs to translate the ones and zeros it has into electrical signals that are then, then sent throughout the cable and received and interpreted as bits by the, the receiving computer. This step, the sending and then the translation from bits to, uh, to electrical signal and from electrical signal to bits, this is everything done by the physical layer. That's the job of the physical layer, right? It makes it possible for us to have this kind of communication. And it's the backbone of the communication, right? I can't do anything else if I can't push um, bits on a cable. This is why it's a very, very important layer, but very hardware, hardware-y, right? So very close to that. For, for us and for our purposes, this is good enough um, in terms of understanding for the physical layer. And we can progress with the data link layer. So the data link layer, while the physical layer makes it possible in the first place to, to push bits onto a cable and to read them from the cable, is concerned with correct transmission. So what if a bit is sent, but on the way some error occurs and the bit is switched from a zero to a one or, or one to a zero, right? This is where um, the data link layer comes in and makes sure that it's also done correctly. Um, it makes use of the physical layer. Like I told you, physical layer is the backbone. Everything else is built on top of it. And um, it's also re uh, responsible for receiving data streams. So what that means is it handles, for example, if I have two packets that are sent back to back, where does one packet end and where does one packet start? This is a question that's also responsible. Um, the data link, uh, data link layer is also responsible for. It also has error detection and recovery if errors are detected, right? That um, happen on the physical layer. So whatever um, a bit is switched, basically, that's the kind of question that we try to answer. And um, if we had to assign the MAC address that we previously talked about to a layer, the MAC address would live in the data link layer, right? And um, so the data link layer is also responsible for making the communication happen with an alarm. Uh, so if you had to remember something at this point, I would say MAC address belongs to the second layer, the data link layer, which is very closely connected to local area networks and communication within that kind of network. 
Um, so a very important protocol, a very interesting one, is the ARP protocol. And this ARP protocol is often assigned to this data link layer. And I want to go through uh, this ARP protocol and how it works and what, what it is used for, just for you to give an idea, okay? So ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. And the issue that this protocol is trying to solve, because why would you have a protocol if it's not a solution to a problem you have, right? Is this, imagine you're in a local area network, right? Um, for example, at home, and you, would, you have two computers there. And you would like to send a packet from computer A to computer B. Um, however, you do know the IP address of computer B, but you don't know its MAC address. So that's a problem, right? Especially because we want to use MAC addresses on local area networks to send packets. So the IP address is not completely irrelevant, but I need the MAC address if I want to send to a computer on the same, same local area network, right? So how do I get the MAC address if I have the IP address? That's what the ARP protocol is for. So the way this works is, again, we have this kind of setup. We have three computers and we have computer A and computer B which are in um, a local area network and we i just assigned them two ip addresses and two mac addresses okay so in computer a wants to send computer c a message but doesn't know its mac address however it knows its ip address so how can computer a figure out that computer c's mac address is all c's well it will make what is called an arp request so the arp request is is a, is a packet basically that asks the following question hey um, I'm looking for the computer that has the IP address free, 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 free. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you look like. I don't know your MAC address, but I need it. Could you please tell me? My MAC address is this, right? So, um, so you know who to send the answer to. Now you have one more problem. So this is a good packet, right? If this packet reaches computer C, C will see that it's um, someone's looking for its MAC address because it really uh, recognizes its own IP address and can answer. However, how does A know where to send this packet, right? This is basically a chicken and egg problem. How can A send this packet to C if for in order to send it, it will need its MAC address, right? So this is kind of a, a pickle we're in. Well, there's an easy fix to it. Um, what is done is that this packet is not sent to one specific entity, but rather broadcasted. So for a packet to be broadcasted means it is sent to every computer in the local area network. Okay. Um, how is this done technically? Well, <clears throat> if I had to put in a MAC destination address, uh, I don't have one, right? So I need to put some replace or placeholder in there. What is used is the, the MAC address FFF, so everything um, with the letter F. What happens then is, that if this packet is, is sent to a switch, the switch will copy this packet and send it to every possible output link that it has. So basically, one, when a packet is broadcasted, it's sent to every possible computer in the local area network. So A does this, it forms this ARP request, writes in who belongs, uh, who, the, who owns this IP address, I need your MAC address, and broadcasts it throughout the internet. Because it's broadcasted, it's sent to every possible computer, uh, including C. So when C re receives this request, it will answer with a response or reply, right? And um, in it will say, well, I realized that you're looking for my MAC address uh, and this is my IP address, right? I recognize this. So um, I tell you, my MAC address is this and this and this and this. And because um, C knows where this packet was coming from, this, this original request, it can directly send this back to A. And at this point, A knows C's MAC address and it can send it the packet that it originally wanted to send. So to summarize what we saw in the address resolution protocol, um, the ARP protocol solved this issue of getting the MAC address if you have the IP address, and it makes use of an ARP request that it broadcasted throughout the entire local area network, and an ARP reply that is created and sent by the device that the MAC address is asked for. And um, this way you can make a mapping between an IP address and a MAC address, right? And this is an important piece of information, right? If you want to broadcast something um, in the local area network using MAC, you would use the, um, the MAC address with all Fs in there. 
right? Um, one interesting thing is you might have asked yourself at this point or before when we talked about switches and routers, how do switches and routers know where to send packets, right? How do they know where destination is? A very complex question. We'll talk a tiny bit about in the next layer. But um, for switches, they basically learn by observing, right? Because when we go back here, if A is sending an ARP request, right, in, in this setting, the switch below it will receive it. And when it does so, it will write down what it sees. It sees, well, A, so there's a computer with a MAC address A, and it's located on my top interface, and it will write that down. Whenever there's a packet coming in now for computer A, it will know where it, come, where it has to go because it received a packet from it earlier. And the same thing is done with C and B, right? Every time you do ARP request or ARP response, the, the packets pass through the switches and the switches will just note down what they see. Oh, I received the packet from this computer, from this interface. And the next time they have to relay packets there, they just copy that. That's the basic idea of how, how it works. So, one last piece of information. Um, the ARP model is often assigned to the data link layer, but sometimes also associated with the network layer. This is more of a theoretical question, really, than a practical one. Um, but I just thought it might be important to mention. So the next layer we're looking at is the third layer, which is the network layer. So the network layer is concerned with how entities can find and communicate with each other, with each other over the data link layer, right? Again, we have this, this kind of um, building on top of each other. So the network layer is where IP addresses and the IP protocol live. Um, and as we saw with the example um, that we had previously at the beginning of the presentation, the network layer cares for getting a packet from its source to its destination. Um, I think we might have a question again. How does a device know that what IP address was assigned to it? Is that the question? I think, right? How does a device know what IP address was assigned to it? So this is... How do I say this? Give me a second. Again, a bit more complicated topic, right? So you can ask the question differently, right? Um, how do I know what IP address I have? It's a different way of asking this question. Um, how do I as assign IP addresses, right? So the way this works can be, there are multiple ways, but the two most common ways that you will see is this. Either, so let's make this a bit more practical. Let's say you're at home and you have a router, right? And uh, you, have a, you have bought internet access by an internet service provider, let's say Vodafone, because that's the one I know. Um, what happens is that Vodafone is going to contact your router, basically, and gonna, it's going to say, listen up, your IP address is this and this and this and this. So the router have this, has this information, right? Um, you also have this information on paper, maybe, um, depending whether, like, this is getting complicated. But let's say the router has this information. And one very common way of dealing with how to assign IP addresses is a protocol that's called DHCP. So basically, it's, it's, it's running on the router and all the devices that want to connect to the network. And every time you enter a network uh, in the DHCP protocol, what happens is basically that you ask for an IP address. Hey, I want to join this local area network. Can I get an IP address, right? And uh, you communicate with the router and the router is going to tell you. There are a lot of checks and a certain way of communicating to make sure that no one has the same IP address, right? Um, that's the very common way that you will see. That's the automatic way. You can also give them IP addresses manually by just going into the settings and entering, well, now you have this IP address, pum, 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 pum. That's also a way of doing it, basically. I hope that answers the question. Let me see. Great. Um, 
that's clear. Okay. So we were at the network layer. And so we talked about IP addresses and the IP protocol lives in the network layer, which is the third layer. And it's very concerned with getting packets from its source to its destination, right? So I want to make something clear. And I think this is something that's really nice to understand and that you will not get in a book, really. It's the kind of intuitive thing that I want, right? Um, something I find very interesting is, so I can go in a book and I can look at the protocols and they make sense. But I, what I really always want is intuition. I want to understand why do we have these layers? Like, why are they the way they are, right? And um, what are the different purposes and how would you characterize them? And one interesting thing I would like you to understand if you come out of this presentation is what the layers basically do. And to just give you a small recap on that. So the first layer was the physical layer and it dealt with, I have computer A, I have computer B, they connected through cable. How do I get information from A to B, right? Through the cable. How do I translate bits into cable information and cable information to bits if you want so. Then we had the data link layer. And that was more with communication on local area network, right? So how do I get information with something like the ARP protocol from one computer on my local area network to the next? Now, the next level, if you go one further up, is the network layer. And the network layer doesn't care for local area networks anymore, but rather for the wide area networks, like the internet. It cares for getting a packet A, uh, for getting a packet from a computer A to a computer B, and that doesn't matter if they are miles and miles apart, right? Somewhere on different sides of the globe. And they're all based on each other. So the network layer couldn't function, couldn't possibly function if the data link layer wouldn't guarantee that um, communication in a local area network doesn't work, right? And the local area, uh, the, the data link layer wouldn't work and couldn't possibly work if it didn't have the guarantees that are given to it by the physical layer, okay? So physical layer is for communicating between two computers. It's like, this is an intuitive understanding, I think. Um, data link layer is for communication on a local area network. And the network layer is for communication over the whole internet, a wide area network, okay? Um, so one very important thing um, that's not only relevant to, to the network layer, but um, very relevant to it specifically is routing. So routing answers this question of, how do I, so if I'm a router and I get a packet and it tells me, oh, this packet is to go, supposed to go to this IP address. How do I get it there? I have 10 possible ways to send it. Which one is the right one? Um, and this is a topic on its own. It's very interesting. Um, so dealing with how, where to send packets. And <clears throat> sorry, let me get a sip of water. What you have to understand there, it's a very complex problem. Why is it complex? Because you have millions and millions of routers in the world, right? And you have millions of millions of IP addresses. And each router, all of these million routers need to know where to send a packet and it could have every possible IP address. So every possible router in the world needs to know where to send a packet depending on every possible IP address. Quite complex, right? Um, so how is this done? Well, short answer is there are some protocols for it, right? So these are, I think, the three most common ones. Maybe you heard of them. It's like open shortest path first, OSPF, or RIP, a routing, routing information protocol, or the intermediate system to intermediate system, the ISIS protocol. And this, these are protocols that each router runs, right? So if you have a network of routers, basically, you have to imagine like a spider web. And um, all these routers are directly or indirectly connected, you could say. They will communicate with each other. They will say things like, oh, my local area network, I can, um, I can send packets to this and to this and to that. And they will exchange this information. And after the information is exchanged, they make smart decisions. They will ask the question, well, I know all this information. Which path should I send so the packet arrives to the fastest, right? So it's basically running um, shortest path algorithms, if, if that's some, uh, some meaning to you. For example, um, some of them are built on Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, some of them are built on the Bellman Fort equation, right? This is what you use in shortest path kind of settings. Two things you would probably uh, you would probably heard of, um, right? And I think it's a, for me this is like very personal. Maybe the biggest and the most important of the layers, right? If you talk about the internet, the network layer is really the the characterizing layer there. Um, problem, it's too big for us to talk about now. It's uh, my favorite layer. It sounds very nerdy, I know, but it's my favorite layer. 
Um, so if you're interested in this, this is something that we talk about in our cybersecurity bootcamp more, right? About understanding the layers and how to attack and defend, um, make attacks specific to this layer and how to defend against them, right? Things like DDoS attacking, how you can make things sure with VPNs or Tor, the Tor browser, right? Everything related to the network layer and the other layers as well. So if you find this interesting, maybe check out our bootcamps, right? Um, so this concludes the third layer. And we come to the fourth layer, the transport layer. So as I told you before, we have the three layers and together what they make possible is for us to get a packet from one computer to another computer somewhere in the world, right? Why do we need more layers? And that's a good question. Well, there are two reasons really. So the first one is if, I'm, if I have a computer or a phone, right? And I get a packet. The computer asks this question. It's going to ask the question, okay, I have this packet, it's for me, but I have so many things that this packet could belong to, right? If you get an internet packet on your, on your phone, does it belong to WhatsApp? Does it uh, belong to a calendar? Is it an email? Is it an update? Is it a podcast news update, right? It could be anything. So these kind of different things that run on your computer, right? Could be application or services. Um, if a packet arrives, your computer needs to decide which of these applications this packet belongs to. Suddenly we have a problem, right? And what is done, although network layer, digital uh, did, um, data link layer and physical layer make it possible to get this packet to the computer, we need a new component of addressing, which is called ports. Um, so basically, each application or computer gets this number assigned to it, which is a port, right? So things that are very common, if you're into networks, is that DNS services have the port 53 and web services have port 80. And the Minecraft server, if you run a Minecraft server, it has port 25565. So what does that mean? If you get a packet next to having a MAC address and an IP address, it will also have a port, a destination port. So when it arrives at your computer, your computer will look at the port and the destination port might be 25565 and the computer will, oh, this is supposed to be sent to the Minecraft server. This is Minecraft server data and it will send it there, okay? Um, so <clears throat> if we talk about this, it makes a lot of sense for some services to always have the same, same port numbers, right? For example, a web server that's run, running HTTP, which we'll talk about in a second as well, usually has a port number 80. Why? Because if every, server on the world would have a different um, port number for, for websites, it would get very confusing. Not only do I have to find the server and get my packet there, but I also need to ask, so which port number should I send it to you so it gets to your web server? Right? So to avoid this kind of problem, what we do is we say every web server, if you want to, to get data um, from or to a web server, you write it to, to port 80. Okay, or well, if you want to get it to a Minecraft server, it's always going to be 25565. And just to make something clear, if I write to a server, the destination port address is going to be 80 for web site, right? But the source that I'm sending it from can be anything. It's about the server, right? Because everybody's using the server. It's the basic idea behind ports. So I told you that the transport layer had two purposes. So firstly, this port, right, to differentiate the final destination on the final computer. But it also cares, <coughs> sorry, it also cares about reliable transmission. Up until now, we can get one or two packets somewhere in the world. But what if I send 10 packets, right, maybe a file, and on the way to um, the computer, to the destination computer, they go different paths throughout this network. Let me get a sip of water. They take different paths to get to the destination computer. So some of them might arrive a bit earlier, while some of them might arrive later. Suddenly the order isn't in, uh, in order anymore, right? The last packet might be the first and the first one might be the last. What if a packet gets lost? What if um, there is a fault with one packet, right? This is these are mechanisms that we really didn't care for up until now. The data link layer took care of this a bit for local area networks, but not for the, for the internet. So the transport layer, <coughs> excuse me, has mechanisms that make sure of this, right? So 
What do we have from the transport layer? Let's get the intuition again uh, rolling. So firstly, ports, which are very important. And second, um, mechanisms that take care that no errors happen and uh, messages don't get lost. So when you talk about the transport layer, right, if you ever did, there are two basic abbreviations that you will always hear. The first one is user data grim protocol, UDP, and the next one is TCP. So these are two protocols. So if you want to send a packet, you will make sure that you will basically use one of these two protocols. Okay. So the UDP protocol is a simpler protocol. It's basically has fault checking. So if a packet comes, we'll see, okay, is this in the state that it was sent? Is something um, different? Did something go wrong? But nothing else. We'll not ask for anything else. TCP is a much more complex, a much more dedicated protocol alternative. Um, so it's what's called a stateful protocol. What is a stateful protocol? Well, what happens with UDP is basically, I have 10 packets to send, I just send them and they're on their merry way, good luck. I hope you arrive and I don't care anymore. What happens with TCP is that before sending any packet, I will first communicate with the server. I was like, I would be like, Hey, how are you doing? I would like to send you some packets. This, uh, some packets. The server would respond to me. Okay, um, let's do that. Do you want to use TCP? Yeah, me too. Okay. And how much should I send you per minute? Right. These kind of questions. Before even starting, they communicate. And um, they have a lot of nice features with TCP, right? They have fault checking like UDP, but they have also things like making sure that the packets come in order, right? Every packet has a number. So number one, two, three, four. If the, the receiver gets four, three to one, it will know, oh, these are switched. I can just reorder them. It has adaptive traffic rates. So what happens is that imagine the computer you're sending traffic to is really overloaded suddenly. TCP makes it possible for them to communicate, hey, can you go a bit slower with the packets? Also, if the internet is very, very busy right now, it's not a smart idea to, to send a lot of data at once because a lot of it can get lost, right? We don't want to um, maximize the load, really. So TCP is very considerate. That's what I'm trying to say with all of this. It, it tries to look that everything arrives nicely in order. It tries to not send too much. It tries to send as much as possible in order to be effective, but not too much for, for, the, for the final computer or the network to be overwhelmed, right? So it's a nice protocol. Um, to checks for network conditions and the conditions on the receiver side. So one very interesting thing I told you before, if you use TCP instead of UDP, you will first communicate with the receiving uh, side, right? Before you even send the packet. So this communication is called the TCP freeway handshake. And if you ever look into network, um, network related topics, this is something that's a must know. So basically if a computer A and B, they will exchange free messages. So A will send to B a SYN message, will basically say, hey, I want to build a TCP connection to you. Um, what do you think about that? Computer B then, if it wants to accept it, will send a SYN arc and message. And this one basically tells like, okay, I'm in, let's do it. Um, these are my parameters. Is that okay for you? And finally, computer A will send the last and uh, final and third message, the, the last arc message, and will say, yes, these are okay for me, right? By having these three messages, these are the minimum amount of messages for them to communicate that they both want to communicate with each other using TCP and both having a certain set of parameters maybe that they want to communicate to each other. Okay. Um, so this is the TCP freeway handshake, also very important. If I use TCP before sending any packet, this will always happen, right? So if you open like, um, um, for example, something, a tool called Wireshark, where you see all the packets that come out and into your computer, if you open anything that uses TCP, these three packets will always be on top and then all the data that you really sent. Okay, very important to understand. This brings us to the fifth and final layer, which is called the application layer. So the application, so by now we really have a good time sending packets, right? The physical layer makes it possible to send it to computers, data link layer within my local area network. The network layer makes it possible to send it from one computer on one side of the internet to another computer on the other side of the internet. 
And the transport layer makes sure that everything arrives nicely, that the computer knows which service to send a certain packet to, and everything arrives in order and not too fast, and a lot of packets are lost. But now comes basically the cherry on top, the application layer. This is where the data lives. If you, why do you care about this, right? If you have an application like WhatsApp, this is all really nice to get a packet, right, from A to B, but it still has to have some data in set. It's the original purpose of it, really, in, in most cases. So um, these, this includes all the protocols used by most applications for providing user services, right, like WhatsApp, emails, everything like that. And um, a very important thing is that each application defines its own way of communication. And so when we talk about an application that's from a network perspective, we ask three very important questions when designing it. Um, so the first one is which architecture? So which computer does what? What kind of processes are there? We'll talk about that in a second. The next thing is a communication protocol. So what sequence of messages can be exchanged? For example, if we look back at the AIP protocol, the, the, the basic communication protocol is you send um, a request and you get a reply, right? So each application needs to define its own kind of language. How do I request data? What kind of, um, what kind of question should I ask? How are questions formed? Which kind of parameters do I give? Which ones can I use? All of this is part of the communication protocol. And we'll see what kind of things there are really um, also. The next thing is the transport layer technology. So that's the question um, of whether UDP or TCP should be used. So we didn't talk about this really, right? We talked about UDP being simpler and not doing a lot of checking and TCP doing a lot of checking and being really nice. So why shouldn't you use TCP all the time? It's, um, it's more work. It's more work for both of us to always check with each other if everything is okay. It's more work. Um, for me to be slow when the receiver doesn't want a lot of data, right? UDT is basically throw it all on the internet. It will probably find its way. And so why would you ever use UDP? Sometimes it's really nice to use UDP because you don't care that some packets get lost. For example, the video that I'm sending you right now, right? You get this live video of me at my screen. This is probably sent in UDP. Why? Because if a frame or two get lost, we don't care for that. What you really care about that we don't have too much lag right now, right? That we are live. Um, for something like a file where every bit makes a difference between a file working and a file being complete garbage, that's where you use TCP for being perfectly correct. Okay. So when you when it comes to transport layer technology, you have to ask, okay, what kind of things do I expect from it? Do I want perfect but maybe slow transmission or very fast one, right? Not like with UDP, but maybe faulty. These are questions you ask. Mm -hmm. So I told to you the first thing here is the architecture, right? I think, I hope the transport layer technology part of this question is clear. Communication protocol we'll talk about later. So what is about, what about the architecture? So basically when it comes to architecture, you have two big choices. So the first one is a very common architecture model. <coughs> Get something to drink. It's a very common one, um, which is called the client server model. So the client server model has two entities, really, the server and the client, and the server has all the data, right? Um, the data that the client is interested in. For example, a website often is located on a server. So the, the, the data lives on the server. A lot of clients can ask the server, hey, can you give me the website data? I want to look at it in my browser. And um, many clients ask one server. Right? And the server serves requests, basically. That's the basic idea. And um, exactly, the clients request services and information from the servers, which are then sent back to the clients, right? This is the basic setting. This is very common. Maybe your first thought, if you think about how, how the internet works and that kind of thing. The next one is a bit more specific. So it's called peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so in it, we don't have a server that has all the data and a client that wants to request it. Rather, we have, there are no roles. Everybody has the same role. So what that often means is that um, resources are shared between all the peers, right? Instead of 10 files living on one server, um, I have one part of the file, you have one part of the file, and this third person has a part of the file. And in a peer-to-peer -peer network, we work together. We exchange everything at once. 
And so in a way you could say a peer in this peer-to-peer -peer network is a client and a server at the same time. So if I still have your attention, I would like to ask a question. Um, and the question is, why would you ever prefer a client server model over a peer to peer network or the other way around? Can you imagine, let me ask this question, when a peer to peer network might be smarter? Do you have any idea about that? So when is a peer-to-peer -peer network maybe smarter than a client-server model? No worries. It's a hard question. Um, so I could give you... So we have Angela writes, controlled data dissemination on server, but more opportunities for backups. That's true. That's a good point. Very fair point, Angela. Um, Next to this, we have a different point also um, that I wanted to specifically tell you here. It's also about performance. So the interesting thing is, if let's have a situation, right, where we have 100, let me open the slide again, where we have 100 clients and they want to all access a file on one server. So suddenly the server has to send um, 100 files to people all around the internet. The problem and the bottleneck in this kind of scenario is writing bits onto the cable. That takes forever, right? Um, so in this setting, maybe a peer-to-peer -peer network is better because you don't have one server that has to write all these, all these files onto the cable, but you have 100 clients that each has one piece of the data and all of them can write and read at the same time, right? So sometimes in the setting, peer-to-peer -peer is more efficient. However, it's also more complicated. Having one centralized structure that has the files is very simple, right? If I want a data file, I go to the server. If I'm in a peer-to-peer -peer network, if I want this data file, I need to ask these 10 computers if they have the data I'm looking for. And each gives me one piece and I need to reassemble it, right? Much more complex. And so a lot of um, data sharing sites often use peer-to-peer -peer, like Torrent. Uh, if, you, if you ever heard of this, right? This is a peer-to-peer -peer site. Torrenting is working peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you ever wondered, so in Germany, there was this law that's very interesting, I think, that if you're watching movies online, um, pirated movies, um, that that would be a gray area kind of in terms of le legality. But if you use something like torrenting to download files, um, that's a very clear violation. And the reason is the way these torrenting websites work is that if you download files from them, you're then also giving them to others back, right? So this is a peer-to-peer -peer network. If you want to if you want to watch a movie, take it. But next time someone asks, I might tell them to get it from you, right? And suddenly you're uploading and downloading um, illegal movies, uh, and then you get uh, like it's very easy to 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 be guilty in this kind of setting, right? That's the difference you have. So we will talk now about two applications, which I find the two most important ones that you can have, and um, as for an intuition. So the first one is the domain name system, um, the DNS protocol. And I, talk, I talked to you about how the, an application is designed. So it has an architecture, communication protocol, and transport layer technology. And this is basically the character sheet for this application. So the architecture is client-server model. The communication protocol is a DNS protocol. It decides it's very specific to DNS. We don't care too much about it. And the transport layer technology is UDP, but sometimes also TCP. But for now, we'll write UDP, okay? So what is DNS? We might have another question, I think. Peer-to-peer -peer uses UDP only is a question. Um, not as far as I know, um, shouldn't be the case. If you, if you, why would you, so where does this come, question come from? Because in something like torrenting, right, where you share files, often when you talk about file sharing, you want to use TCP actually, right? Because like I told you, if one bit is wrong in a file, the whole file is garbage. That's why, um, for example, but torrenting, which is peer-to-peer, -peer, use TCP. Um, but so I think 
whether something is using one architecture or another doesn't have any influence on the transport layer, right? So you can have all possible combinations. I hope that answers the question. Um, so again, DNS, uh, client server architecture and uses UDP. So what is DNS good for? You remember with ARP, we had this question of, hey, I need this IP address, um, I need this MAC address, but I have this IP address. DNS is similar in that it asks, hey, this time I need the IP address and what I have is a URL. So what is a URL? Um, the URL is basically the, the google.com, right? So if you write something out in your browser, browser, you should, in a sense, write IP addresses in your browser, right? Because that's how your computer knows where to send stuff. But you can actually do that. Do we have another question? Let's check. When to use which protocol is a dilemma during development? Mark, um, could you rephrase the question? When to use which protocol is a dilemma during development? So I talked about the um, TCP and UDP kind of dilemma, or the, do you mean the client server peer to peer um, dilemma that I talked about? For UDP application. So is your question that I talked about this dilemma between using TCP and UDP and when to use which? Is that your question? Yes, okay. So when to use TCP and when to use UDP. Let me get back to that on you. Um, let's open the slide that's relevant for this. Here you go. <clears throat> so just a small recap. Um, so UDP has only very little mechanism, extra mechanisms, right? It has fault checking. So it checks whether a packet is correct or not. But what TCP has as an alternative, it has um, fault checking. It also checks whether packet arrive, packets arrive in order. So if I send one, two, three, that it arrives one, two, three. Um, it has adaptive traffic rates. So if the computer I'm sending to has a lot of loads, it will send slower, but if it can receive more, it will um, send faster. If the internet is very busy, it will send slower because a lot of packets would get lost. If it's very, very nice to send good conditions, it will send more. So TCP is better in a sense, if you want. So from a quality, qualitative point of view, but having extra mechanisms comes with extra work. So if you decide between UDP and TCP, you have to ask what you want. If you want to send a file, for example, right, or an email, you want it to be perfect. You don't want a file where numbers are different, right? A file is a file. It should be one-to-one -one the same, whether it's sent or not sent, right? In this case, you would want to use TCP. Because even though TCP is more work, it's really good at making sure that the file is correct and perfect. If you don't care a lot about the thing being perfect, but rather about it being efficient, then you want to use UDP because it doesn't do so much extra fancy stuff. If you do a voice call, right, over the internet, if you do a video call like we're doing right now, it's sent over UDP. Because one frame or one second of the call being lost, not a problem, right? Uh, as long as it's up to date and live and it doesn't have a lot of lag. So this is the question. What do I want from my application? Do I want it to be fast, maybe a bit more more errors or missing packets, or do you want it to be perfect and I invest the extra time in it? This is the question and the dilemma you always have. I hope that is clear now, Mark. Okay. Mark seems to your question seems to be answered. So Ben, you asked if we can talk about VPNs for a bit. Um, how about this? It's not on the plan. But at the end of the session, I don't mind talking about it, right? Um, so I can talk about VPNs and how they work, the basic idea behind them. Is that a deal? Let's do it like that. So I finish my presentation, hopefully in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> and um, then I'll talk about it. So we talked about DNS. So again, DNS is a protocol which helps you in the following situation. 
if you know that you want to visit google.com, you need its IP address, right? In order to send it to, to the google.com server. But how do you get this IP address? You don't have every possible IP address on your computer, right? So DNS helps you in this kind of, in this kind of um, situation. So I told you it's a client server setup, client server architecture. Each of your browsers has what is called a DNS client running on it. And um, so the DNS client will locate a DNS server, which is somewhere in the world, there are multiple ones, and ask this question. It's asking, hey, I want to know the IP address of google.com. Um, so there are many, many servers in the world, DNS servers, and every browser is a DNS client. The DNS clients ask the servers, hey, can you help me with this IP address? Okay. And um, we'll talk about the servers that these DNS servers in a second. But your computer and your browser always know the closest DNS server that exists locally, right? Because if, if there's a DNS server one kilometer from me and one on the other side of the world, I probably should take the one that's close to me, right? For everybody's happiness. It's faster this way. Um, how do they know which DNS server is closest? This is told by the router most of the time, right? In this, we talked about this DHCP and protocol. This also contains things like the DNS server that's closest. So this closest DNS server, basically your DNS server that you will use is called the local DNS server. And it will, so how does this local DNS server know the IP address of google.com? Well, it, it doesn't maybe, but it knows other DNS servers that can help. So I want to, this is really cool, right? So um, I want to show you how these requests for asking for IP addresses is solved. And for that, we need to understand the three server types that we have. So three DNS servers. So the first ones are called authoritative servers. And basically, if I make a website, right, and I call it nicenetworks.com, I need to have an authoritative DNS server in a very simple manner, I mean, always specific things, but I, I need an authoritative server. And I'm, this is my authoritative server. It's called the nicenetworks.com authoritative server. And because it's my DNS server, it will know the IP address of my server, right? So if anyone is asking, hey, what's the IP address of nicenetworks.com? This authoritative server is responsible specifically for nicenetworks.com and will give the IP address, okay? So each DNS name has an authoritative server somewhere in the world they exist one or multiple, for example, google.com or google.de authoritative servers. Everything has an authoritative server and the authoritative server always knows the IP address, okay? Um, the second type of server is a TLD server. So the TLD server isn't responsible for specific DNS names like google.com or, Google, uh, or um, youtube.com. It cares for the domain. So it can be responsible for everything with .de or .ch or .com or .org, right? So that there's a TLD or multiple TLD servers that are responsible for .com. There are some that are responsible for .org, okay? And um, the thing is, while the authoritative servers always knew the IP addresses of the, of the websites they're trying to, to, um, to serve for, um, TLD servers may not know the IP address, although they're responsible for it, but they know all the authoritative servers that, are, that might be responsible. So they always can't ask them. We'll talk about that in a second. The last server is the root server, and the root server doesn't know maybe IP addresses, but it knows all the TLD servers. So how does this work? So why did I talk about these servers, right? Imagine that's you, right? You have a computer and you know your local DNS server is located somewhere. You will ask this question, um, hey, local DNS server, can you help me with finding the IP address of uh, www.google.com? Right? Your browser is asking this. If you type in www.google.com, your browser will be like, oh, I need an IP address for that. So let's start my DNS client on ask my local DNS server. The local DNS server gets this request and it's like, I don't know, but I need to figure this out. I'm responsible for this client, right? So what it will do is every DNS server in the world knows one root server, right? So we'll ask this question, the root server, it's be, be like, hey, root server, do you know the IP address of google.com? Um, Google the root server, as I told you, probably doesn't know the IP address, but it knows every TLD, um, TLD server in the world. 
you will also know the TLD server for .com, right? Which is responsible for Google.com. So the root server will be like, hey, you're responsible .coms. This is a .com address. What's the IP address of this, um, of, of this URL? The .com TLD server might be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know the IP address, but I know the authoritative server of Google.com. And we'll ask the authoritative Google, uh, server, hey, do you know the IP address? And the authoritative server always knows the IP address, right? That's the one responsibility. They will form a response and send it back to the TLD server. The TLD server will be sending it back to the root server. The root server will be sending it back to the local DNS server and find the local DNS server will be like, oh, I solved it for you. The IP address is this address. This is basically how the DNS flow works and how information is sent using DNS. Um, we have another question, I think. Let's check it out. So what's happening when I purchase a domain name? Am I purchasing from whoever owns the authoritative server? What about completely unclaimed domain names? Something I'm not an expert in, but um, you're not purchasing the authoritative server, right? That's something you set up. Basically, you're, you're purchasing the permission to use this and to advertise that you this kind of um, this kind of domain name, right? Um, so if you look at websites, uh, what are the names? I forgot them. You have like domain name websites, right? Um, purchasing from authoritative servers. No. So the way this works is, um, so again, I'm not an expert on this, but what I, I'm pretty sure on is that if you buy uh, a domain name, you then basically create or make use of an authoritative server in order for people to understand and to get IPs, right? So if you, if I have a website, right? I'm making this more simple, maybe. If I have a website, um, let's call nicenetworks.com, I want people to visit it, right? So if they type into their browser nicenetworks.com, they need to be able to, to get my IP address. Once I purchase the server from a, from a distributor of domain sites, I'm allowed to use it. I have the license to use it. And then I can make use of, of a DNS authoritative server. I can make my own, right? Or make use of a public one maybe and tell it to say, hey, if anyone ever asks you nice, uh, nice networks.com, please give them this IP address, right? So I don't buy them from the authoritative server. It's not an authority it's just called an authoritative server because it has authority over one or multiple um, URL names, okay? So basically you're buying the license in order for you to be able to distribute your website on DNS. That's the basic idea. So we have this kind of setting um, with the recursive setup. That's what it's called. You can have the same kind of question, but instead of, so you ask the local DNS server, ask the root server, but instead of the root server now asking the TLD server, which is asking the authoritative server, there can be an iterative method, right? Which includes the root server. Follow up question, let me see. So who owns these licenses and where did they purchase them from? So I know this, I don't know this answer for domain names. I, I think it's very similar to the way that IP addresses work. It's my understanding, right? Um, and maybe I can give you this to just give you an idea, but this is something maybe you should look up because I'm not 100% sure on. Um, so the way it works for IP addresses is that Every time I, so when the internet was built, right? And people were like, oh, we have these IP addresses, which are 32 bits. So we can make these millions of IP addresses. And then they basically started an auction. They were like, okay, who wants this 10,000? Who wants this 10,000? How much do you want to pay for it? How much do you want to pay for it? They did this at the beginning of the internet, basically, when internet service providers were created. And then they owned them and they rent them out. So when new IP addresses get released, which happens, for example, with IPv uh, version six, the auction happens again. And I would imagine that it may be something similar to this, but I don't know this. I'm very sorry. 
from the top of my head. I think I knew this once. I don't know it anymore out of the top of my head. Ah, no worries. Uh, so if you have a question, don't feel bad for interrupting. I love answering questions. So uh, it's it's maybe sometimes I can't, but I, I try. So no problem, Angela. Um, from Ben, is it fair to assume that the authority servers are refreshed often enough to cater for IP address, IP address changes? Does this also mean servers, at least well-known ones, are pretty much fixed, only client devices use dynamic IPs? Yes. So let's let's talk about this. The question that Ben brings up is, we talked about IP addresses being dynamic. Um, so that means IP addresses change all the time. I said a problem for something like DNS, where they they say, well, if you want to visit google.com, you have to go to this IP address. But what if it changes, right? Um, so it's very fair to assume that the, that the IP addresses are dynamically updated. So what happens is, and this is a concept I didn't introduce here, um, but what happens is, a term called caching. So what caching does is imagine you have a root server, right? And this root server will get millions of requests because it's a very big, big server. And it will get the, and I bet you the request to uh, google.com will be the one that it will see most often. So from an efficient kind of perspective, should it always go, oh, I need to ask the authoritative server, or oh, I need to ask the TLD server. No, maybe not. Maybe it should ask once and then save it next time someone asks they're like oh i already looked this up five seconds ago here you go you know, much more much simpler um so give me a question to collect my, my give me a second to collect my thoughts no missing the missing the string um so the, the thing is that you have this caching principle, right? Principle where you save an entry instead of releasing it directly, because if you get the same question asked again, you can just answer like this. So what's the problem there? The problem is, what if I save an IP address, right? I know your IP address is one 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 one. Next time someone asks, I'll just release this. But what if you change your IP address? Suddenly we get into really problematic territory. You are advertising IP addresses that are not mine anymore. Um, by the way, cybersecurity related, this is how attacks can work, where you go, um, you basically poison DNS servers. When you want to visit google.com, instead of getting the Google IP address, I'll give you mine. And you think it's Google, right? This is something where DNS attacks happen. Anyways, so what happens? Um, the problem with caching is if I save entries in order to not always ask, I might have the problem that they might be um, already worn out. They, they're not used anymore. So there are multiple ways of solving this. One is that every time you get asked, or every five seconds, you ask the original authoritative server, hey, is this still act like is this still updated? Is that the right one? Right? That's one way of always checking. And if it isn't, you get the new one. Another way is because you might be so this is a question that Angela um Angela, I hope Angela is pronounced correctly, brought in. Um, and I think the, the two questions can be nicely combined. Angela asks, can't you fix important IP addresses? I know I can do it locally. Yes, you can. Let's not talk about local ones, but let's talk about global ones. So what if I'm a server and I always want the same IP address, right? That should make sense. That should be possible. Who, how is this done? Well, very simple. I talk to my internet service provider and I tell them, hey, please fix this IP address. I don't want it to be dynamic, but please fix it. That's also possible. You might have to pay more or there might be some arrangement, but, but that's easily possible. So if I have this, if I buy an IP address and I go to my internet service provider and I tell them, hey, I want this internet address for the next 10 years, right? And I buy it, or let's say for the next year to make it a bit more realistic. I can be sure that all the DNS servers that, um, that serve this, my IP address, they don't need to check me all the time, right? Because I have it for a year, it's not gonna change. You don't need to ask me every five seconds. So what you can say is, if someone asks your authoritative server, for your IP address, you can give this information and tell them, hey, this IP address will be valid for at least a year. Until then, you don't need to ask me again, right? And this is the way that also caching is done um, in order to be always, to be efficient, but also not advertise something wrong. 
So Bang and Angela, does this answer your questions? Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, we're getting to the last few slides. So DNS should be clear by now. Um, so last, next thing, the last application we have a very short look at is HTTP, so the hypertext transfer protocol, which again has a client server architecture, the communication protocol is the HTTP protocol, and the transport layer used is TCP, okay, which makes sense. Website should be correct. So I want to use TCP. If it doesn't matter that it's 100% correct, I would use UDP, right? That's the kind of intuitive idea. So the HTTP uh, protocol is trans uh, responsible for transmitting hypermedia documents such as HTML, right? That's the basic founding block of the website, right? That's the content, the text, everything defines in HTML. So HTTP is responsible for giving you the website content. Um, and it's it's designed with the purpose of being um, the communication medium between a web browser and a web server. So your web browser will ask a web server and the content, like the website, text, the style, the images, everything is communicated via HTTP. Um, sorry. Everything is communicated via HTTP and the HTTP HTTP messages um, sent by the client are called requests and the ones that are sent by servers are and, and the answers are usually called responses, right? So we have requests and responses, very clear, um, typical kind of scenario. Um, so if you make requests, you can make them with GET or POST. So these are commands in the HTTP communication protocol. So GET is basically asking, hey, just give me the website. I just want to look at it. Well, post is saying, have some information about me. So you would use get if you look at a website and you would use post, for example, if you want to give it information like a login. So if you go in login form and you press login, um, what happens is that the post request gets sent. If you just want to look at the Wikipedia article, then that's a get request, okay? And successful responses are given using HTTP or case. So if you ask me for a get request to get um, a Wikipedia article website, and I give it to you, I say, okay, you asked, you basically say get, I say, okay. Right? That's the basic idea. So with that, we finished the network layers and we're almost at the end. Um, if we look back at the network layers, right? We have these five layers, the physical, the data link, the network, the transport and the application. We can make a nicer summary table here. So the physical, if you look at the function column, the physical layer is responsible for transporting bits. The data link layer is for, for communicating within the local area network from intermediate step to intermediate step. So this is also called hop to hop. The network layer is responsible from one computer to the other end to end. The transport layer is responsible to this, like it's to the service really, right? And these are the different functions. And the application layer is the function is defined by its own, right? Uh, by itself, really. There's no higher function, but everything that we do is with the purpose of sending application data. So in addressing, we have the MAC address that's connected to the data link layer, the IP addresses that are connected to the network layer, and TCP and UDP ports that are uh, connected to the transport layer. The devices that we see there, so cables and Wi-Fi belong to physical, switches belong to data link layers, and routers and hosts belong to network layers, okay? Basic summary. Last thing uh, is the packet structure. So we talked about how things get sent and how they basically work, but how do packets look like? So they always start with data, right? I send a packet because I want to send data, so they always need to start with data. And the important thing here is, that the, the packets follow an encapsulation principle. So data is basically the honey core of a packet and around it, there will be multiple layers. The first layer um, contains, is basically assigned the transport, so basically is part of the transport layer. It contains the ports, right? So source and the destination port. This thing, so data with the ports around it, it's called a segment. <coughs> Excuse me. The next layer, wraps around it, contains IP addresses, right? Informa and everything that information kind of um, variables and parameters related to the network layer. This is called a packet. 
at this point, right? If you have this kind of setup. And if you take this and surround it again with a MAC address um, and um, with MAC addresses for everything related to the data link layer, then it's called a frame, right? And this is what basically travels through on, on, on the lines and on the cables. And um, how this is, sorry, I have to drink a sip of water. And how this is used and the way that this works is that if I have data to send to a computer, right? So this is the connection we have. For me, there's a switch, router, switch, router, switch. Um, I want to send it to the, to the computer. Um, so I take my data, put a transport layer, a network layer, and um, the data link layer. So this is a frame at this point. I send it to the switch. So we talked about switches needing only MAC addresses. So the MAC address is contained on the very outer layer, right? So we'll only look at it, we'll be like, all right, I need to send it this way and pass it on. The router doesn't really care for MAC addresses, but it cares for the IP address. So it will remove the outer layer with the MAC addresses, look at the IP addresses and create a new frame, right? Uh, so new outer layer with the new MAC addresses which are that you need in a new local area network. Pass it to the switch. The switch will only need information that's on the outer layer, pass it to the router. The router will look at the, uh, remove the outer layer, look at the IP addresses and pass it onto the computer after adding a frame. <coughs> so the computer that is the destination of this packet or this frame at this point or the segment will look at it, say, yeah, that's me. I want to open it will decide which service this data is going to and finally get the data and send it there. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we talked about official models, right? So the first official model is the TCP IP model, um, where you have the same thing as we talked before, right? The, the model that we worked with up until now was a custom model, really. The TCP IP model is the same, except that the first two layers, the physical and the data link layer, are combined into a network access um, layer. That's basically the translation from what we've been working with to the TCP IP layer. The OSI layer is basically like the custom, um, the custom layer, the, the OSI model is like the custom model we worked with, except that the application layer is split into three different layers. Uh, a new application layer, a different one in that sense, a presentation and session layer. So because they figured out there's a lot of stuff going on in the application layer, that's everything is bunched up into one thing. And we split this up to, um, to basically distribute responsibilities and tasks a bit more, right? So these are the two official models. If you ever want to do a network test or want to have any idea, these are things you have to know at least that they are these, these models, TCIP and OSI, they are these layers in order to re distribute responsibilities and to have an abstraction of what we see. So we are getting to the end of the presentation. Um, we covered the, back, the basics of computer networks and um, what can you do with this kind of knowledge? Well, you can go into web development. This knowledge is necessary for web development. You can go into network engineering or you can go into cybersecurity, right? Um, if you, if you want to go into web development and cybersecurity, check again, maybe one of our courses is for you. And please check again on our website, codelabsacademy.com, the free workshops. Before we get uh, end, anything like this, I want to do a small quiz with you, right? So do me a favor. There is a website called kahoot.it and it's a quiz format where we can pay for a small little quiz um, competition if you want so. Um, so give me one second. So for now, can you please join the server where we have a multiple choice competition about what we talked about up until now? Um, I will check the question that's in the chat. So we didn't do the iterative DNS. We talked about this for a second, right? Would you like me to talk about it again? Angela. Right. And Mark was posting some of the, oh, it's okay. Good. Um, Mark was posting some of the responses that, that HTTP gives. 
uh, using for login use post when it reads Google or internet calls we get. Data sending from header to body, body to body, body to header, which takes more time. Uh, I hope we didn't, right, Angela? Mark, I think I don't understand your question. Data sending from header to body, body to body, body to header, which takes more time. Oh, you're very welcome for the presentation. But if you want to, please stay in the call. Um, we'll cover a multiple choice question just to test your quiz and answer any questions you have. And at the end, I also have an exercise. Um, um, and the VPN, we'll talk about that too. The quiz takes five minutes. Then I'll um, show the exercise, which takes two, three minutes. And then we'll talk about questions you have, anything that you want, I promise. <laughs> yeah, for now, Mark, maybe we go through this question later. I'll check how many people we have. So we have three people in the Kahoot quiz right now. If you're interested, just go to kahoot.it and enter this game pin. And um, we can play some quiz and test if you understood everything correctly. I'll give you 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then we'll start and go through it together. Okay, five, six, nice. 10 more seconds if you want to join. All right, let's start this off. So each round will have a question with multiple choice and we'll see the answers live here. So the question is LANs are smaller networks connecting devices that are geographically close or geographically spread networks that connect many devices. Okay, and most of you got it. So local area networks are local. We don't want to connect devices that are very spread across the world, but very close, right? Okay, so you get points, which is pretty cool. Um, and you get points depending on how fast you answer. Okay, next one. To route to a host in the same LAN, your packet only needs the correct mm -hmm when leaving your computer. So this is not perfectly right, but from an intuitive standpoint, what we talked about up until now. Is it port number, IP address, or MAC address? So if it's in the LAN, we really care about the MAC address. I mean, there are some packets like the ARP packets, like the, you remember the ARP reply and the response. They don't need uh, IP addresses necessarily, um, but they're very specific. Generally, we always need MAC addresses and we, in the, in the LAN, we only need MAC addresses to forward things really. Um, it's not perfectly right, but from an intuitive standpoint, I, I care that this is kind of in your mind. Okay, next question. So the same question, but in a wide area network. So do we need only the correct port number? Do we need only the correct MAC address? Do we need only the correct IP address? Or do we, uh, is nothing right really? So I'm interested in this one. So <laughs> we care about the IP address, but this one is very tricky. If you don't have the correct MAC address, you send out the packet, it comes to the first switch and the switch doesn't know what to do. Do you see what I mean? The, the important thing is the IP address. The MAC address changes all the time. But if you only have the IP address, it doesn't get to the first router. It needs to get to the first router and that's why we need a MAC address. So this is a tricky one off the quiz, I swear. <laughs> So next one, wide area networks are basically our LANs that are connected through routers. Is this correct or not? Okay, 
this one is a quick one. I hope we get 100% correct here. Nice, it's correct, like we talked about. Okay, Angela leading with 27 points. When switches receive frames, they will usually change the MAC address of the packet, the target MAC address of the packet. Is that correct? When switches receive frames or packets, whatever you want to call them, they will change the MAC address. Is that correct or false? So MAC addresses are changed, but they're only changed by, by routers, not by switches. Switches are basically invisible in a sense. They don't change anything. They only push the, um, the packets to the, right, to the right direction, OK? Berlinier is leading now. Next question. Network models are based on components, protocols, or layers. Think about what we talked about, yes, but the model, what is necessary to define a model? That's the question you need to answer. Right, so we talked about protocols in this network models thing, but the way they're defined, they're always based on layers, right? That's the way they're defined. And within these layers, we have protocols. Okay, nice. Let's keep going. The ARP protocol is used in order to find the IP address of a device given the MAC address of the device. Is that correct? ARP protocol is used in order to find the IP address given the MAC address. So, the IP protocol does basically this, but the other way around, right? I want to know the MAC address given the IP address. That's the other way around, okay? So that's why it's false. Okay. It's very close, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Network ma models make use of layers because, A, they make it possible to divide responsibility. B, they correctly capture the reality of how computer networks work. See, we can have many different models that all represent the same. This one is tricky. Let's see. Why do we have layers? Yes, very nice. So they make it possible to divide responsibility. Like I felt like I told a million times, hopefully. Um, B, in a sense, you know, why is it not this one? Why is it not capturing reality? Well, there is no physical layer. There is no application layer in your computer. There's no wall that differentiating one between the other. It's something that we make to make things more simple and have an abstract representation of what happens. It's not reality, really. All right. Next one. The physical layer is responsible for what? Transmission and routing of raw bits, correct transmission or correct routing? Yes, exactly. Transmission and routing of raw bits. Um, so writing onto the cable and from it back to bits. Right. Next one. The data link layer is responsible for what? Correct transmission, correct routing, transmission and routing of raw bits. So this was on the slide of the data link layer. If you think back on it, of it. To it. So transmission and routing of robots was the physical layer. The data layer had some correction um, methods as well. Okay, so it, it, it was responsible for making sure that communication in the LAN works out correctly as well. Uh, next one. Without the functionality of the network layer, we would have problems with what? Just turn on my light real quick. What we would have problems with? Sending messages within LANs, sending messages to other LANs, or creating networks. What's the main thing that we talked about? 
what are IP addresses? All right, the network layers with IP address, what is it important for? Yes, so it's to other LANs. Um, creating networks, I could just hook up one computer to another with an Ethernet cable without really caring for the network layer. I could send a bit from A to B and that would already officially be a network, right? And sending messages with inland, that's where what MAC addresses are for. Okay, Diaz's answer strike of six, not bad. So a router may commonly change a packet's target IP address when sending a packet from one LAN to the next. Is that true? Do routers change target IP addresses? So why is this false? Well, it's IP addresses, guys. Remember, the IP address always stays the same, right? It always stays the same. We change the MAC addresses. So this was a bit tricky, right? A bit of a trap. Um, but it's the MAC addresses that are changed, right? Every time we leave a local area network and get to a new one, that's when we change it. The IP address stays the same throughout this whole journey. Okay. Last three questions. For a voice call, you would prefer UDP or TCP? We we'll care for UDP. Because a voice call, we want it to be have low latency, we want it to be efficient, we want it to be up to date. We don't need it to be perfect. Sometimes in a voice call, um, you might not hear me for a second, but that isn't too, too important. The next one, for a file transfer, you would prefer, I talked about this a lot. <laughs> Guys, if this is not 100%, huh? Uh, almost 100% is TCP. Why? A file transfer has to be perfect. We don't want a different file. We don't want one bit to be different. That's why we use TCP. So final question. Frames encapsulate segments, which encapsulate packets, which encapsulate payloads. So payload represents data. Is that correct? This kind of encapsulation hierarchy. Frames are above segments then packets, then data. False. This is false. Why is it false? I mean, all the right words are in there, um, but it's, so first it's the data, then we put something around it's a segment, then a packet, then a frame. This one basically switches the order of packets and segments. Okay. All right. Let's see. Angela's on third place. Then I have Daniela, or pronounced maybe differently. And first place, we have D. Good job. <laughs> um, with runners up being Bang and B. So this is so we're getting to the end of the workshop. Um, let me have a quick at what we have here. So what will happen now is that I will show you the exercise, the final exercise, two, three minutes. This is something you don't have to do. It's something for you to do when you're at home. Um, and it's something, it's a hard task. It's challenging, but it tests. I, I tried to make this presentation only for this exercise, right? I didn't do the exercise for the presentation, but the other way around. So if you're in the mood, give it a try. Um, I'll show it to you and explain it real short, and then I'll release the sources where you can find this exercise and a solution to it. So the exercise looks like this. You have this network, right? You have a computer, you are the computer on the bottom left and you wanna, you, you're on your computer, remember the introductory example and you type in www.codelabsacademy.com. And then things happen, right? There are ARP requests left and right, there are DNS requests, there are TCP, TCP handshakes. Um, so this happens, right? 
Um, what we can see here is that we have routers and switches, right? With the important interfaces having IP and MAC addresses. What we also have here is a local DNS server, the TLD, the root server, the authoritative server, right? And it makes sense that the authoritative server that's on the top right is in the same local area network as the, 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 the web server of Code Labs Academy, right? And the, the task is that you're positioned on the bottom here, right, where this I is. And you're looking at this on this cable. Your task is to note down and to, to list all the packages that you would see if something like this happened. Okay. So what I want you to do is to have this kind of list. You would have uh, columns for different features of packet, right? So the rows represent packets that you see. So they have a source MAC address, a destination MAC address, source IP, destination IP, source port number, destination port number, UDP, and TCP, whether which one of these is used, and the protocol. And as a small tip, the first packet that you will see is an ARP request. Why? So if you open your browser and you type in www.codelabsacademy.com, your browser will ask, well, I need the IP address. I don't know what to do with this. So I need to do a DNS request. It knows where the local DNS server is. Um, so we'll send a packet, but since it doesn't know any MAC addresses, it will do, the first thing you'll see is the ARP request, right? From this router here to the server, because this router knows the IP address of, because let me tell this a bit more structured, sorry. The computer on the bottom left will know the IP address of the local DNS server by default um, and will send this packet with the IP address to this router in the middle here. This router then also knows the IP address because it's on the packet but doesn't know the MAC address, right? And the first thing this, this, um, this router would do is make an ARP request for the MAC address of this local DNS server. And this is what we would see here. The, this is the source of this source MAC address of this router. It's broadcasting the ARP request, right? That's why we have all S's, F's. And this is something I give to, which we didn't talk about. Um, uh, ARP request doesn't have an IP and a port, right? It doesn't use transport layer technology. It's the only thing that we talked about that has this property, ARP requests and ARP replies. Anyways, fill out this list. I can give you the hint. It's 11 packets that you will see. Um, and what we will do now is to release some things for you, okay? So the first thing that I'll release is a link to the exercise and the solution that you hopefully get. Um, if you press on do it, you will be uh, de redirected to the GitHub page for the exercises and the solution, All right? Try to have a look at the exercise and give it a try. Try as many packets as you can and then look at the solution. The next thing that I'll send out is um, the link to apply to our bootcamp, right? So this is if you are interested, because this is what we will do. This is everything that we will be doing is talk about interesting stuff like computer networks and um, with me and Priyanka and Amel, we'll have daily sessions um, and we'll talk about the basics of computer networks, but then go on to the cybersecurity concepts, right? How can you misuse TCP IP? How can you use misuse TCP, everything like that? So just have a look at the bootcamp um, and see, maybe there's something for you. If you have any problems, if you have any questions, you can ask us. Um, the last thing before going into questions is, and we're talking about VPN, is I would appreciate if you um, just give us some feedback, right? Um, because I do this presentation and if you liked it, it would be nice for me to know that you liked it. It would be also really nice of you if you didn't like it to tell me, what didn't you like? Uh, my face maybe, I can't change that. But what about my explaining method, right? Maybe there's something I can talk about there. Um, this is important for me. If you like, if you like what I did today, that would be really nice if you tell me that as well. And if there's anything you would like me to improve on, I would appreciate that as well. Okay. So I would close, we perfectly did two hours now, close the official part of this workshop. Um, thank you very much for being here. I had a great time talking. I hope you enjoyed it as well and learned a thing or two. Um, if you still have questions uh, or you want to listen to me explaining the idea behind VPNs, stay in here. 
Uh, otherwise, the official part is now over. Okay, I would now look in look in the chat and ask and try to answer questions. Take your time. I'm not going anywhere. If you want to uh, fill out the feedback session first, I'm still here. I'm not running anywhere. Did we do the VPN? No, we didn't. This is a uh, this is a something that I will talk at the end um, to you about. Why is the feedback for cybersecurity? Um, okay, because this is. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, so why is the feedback for cybersecurity? Why is this a cybersecurity workshop? The problem with cybersecurity workshops, I'll tell you, uh, thank you, Colin, um, is I would love to talk about cybersecurity, right? How can you abuse this? But the problem is in order to abuse any system, you will first need to have good understanding of it. You need to know why things are and what the possibilities are. Um, if you want my email, if any questions, you can just write me on this email, I'll be happy to help you and answer any questions. Anyways, to uh, to pen test or do cybersecurity in any system, you need to understand it. And if I want to do a beginner's course, it's hard to assume that you all know D DNS perfectly, so we can do some DNS abusing, right? Um, this is why this is called a cybersecurity workshop, although it covers the basics. Um, but talking about VPNs, um, Bang, your question was regarding VPNs, right? Do you want me to just explain the basic idea behind VPNs? Or what is uh, what would you like me to do? Yes. Okay. I mean, we can be interactive. I feel like um, if you're still in the mood for this, what do you think is a VPN? Does someone of you know? I mean, you probably by now the last few years it got more and more um, relevant and more and more important, right? So I wouldn't be surprised. Doesn't it make the long way around instead of the shortest? That's a good way. Can you please post the external links again? Um, yes. How it can be private. Uh, wait, I'll external links. So this one is for the application, if you want to have a look at that. And this one is for the slides. No, not the slides. You want the, the link to the exercises and the solution. Okay, um, a spy. All right, we're getting into the right direction. So let me tell you. Let's make this interesting. Let's say I'm a hacker, right? And there's a website I would like to hack. So I go on this website and I have a really nice vulnerability and a nice exploit that I want to use, right? And I crack the website, let's say. I crack the login, I get like really nice root privileges and I get like a lot of data, maybe some logins, maybe some credit card, I, you know, I get something, I get something out of it. And then the job is done. And I'm happy, right? I got what I wanted. What's the problem? Well, the problem is every time you access a system and you visit a website, you do a request, remember? So if you send a request, it also contains a source IP address. So if you ever send a packet to me as a server that you used to, to basically uh, breach my defenses with, I know your IP address in this general situation. Why is that a problem? IP addresses are changing dynamically. Well, they are. But the ISPs, the internet service providers that you get the IP address from, they know which IP address you had at which time point. So if the police is trying to find someone that hacked the website, they ask, okay, I have this IP address. Which ISP is uh, renting out this IP address? And they have to tell them. They have to tell oh, it's me, I'm Vodafone. I gave uh, this guy, Devram, I, I gave him this IP address on this day. And I'm as a hacker, I have a problem, right? This is the problem that we have. So this is from a hacker perspective. Why would you as an individual care for? Because the hacker doesn't want his or her IP address to be known, right? This is the, the idea behind VPNs. So why wouldn't you do that? Well. The problem is nowadays in the digital world, you're getting tracked, right? Um, you get tracked 
everywhere, IP addresses. So multiple servers will look at which IP addresses are used to access them. And they can see, oh, this IP address accessed me and you and then that. Maybe it accessed, I don't know, uh, a website talking about illness and then a website talking about, I don't know, medical supplies. And together, these websites can build a profile of you. You don't need that, right? Maybe you don't want that. It's not that bad all the time, but it can be. You don't need everybody to know your IP address, right? Another thing, if you have Netflix, right? Um, some of you do other services. You might know that some of the Netflix shows are available in your country, but not available outside of it. If you ever went to the um, like internationally travel, you tried to look up your favorite TV show, maybe you're like, oh, this, this is not available in the country currently yet because of licensing, right? In Germany, they, like Netflix Germany bought a show that uh, Netflix Slovenia didn't, for example, right? How do they know where you are? How do they know that you're not in Germany right now? By the IP address. They can't tell exactly where you are, like your home address, but they can tell which the biggest internet service provider is in your area, right? So again, a situation where it would be nice to have a different IP address than your original one, right? And this is where VPNs come in, virtual private networks. So the way that you will get see them get used most of the time is that there are servers, right? I'm, for example, I'm a VPN, let's say. Um, I'm not VPN, you could say. The way this works is that you come to me and you say, hey, I don't want my IP address to be leaked to everybody. I want to be able to have a different IP address for my personal reason. I don't really care as the provider, right? Now, what I'm saying is, no problem. Um, give me money per month or per year, right? And that's how this kind of, kind of works. And what happens is, if you send a packet, right? Let's say you send a packet um, with your IP address being one, not a real IP address, but let's say, right, you're sending an IP address, uh, a packet with source IP address one and destination IP address nine, okay? So it's from one to nine. If anybody looked at this packet, they would see, oh, it's from one, right? So what you do is instead of sending it to nine, you send it to me. You send it to me. I get it and I put an extra layer on top of it. And I say, this packet is from me, actually. It's not from one, it's from me, it's my packet. I'm the VPN provider, it's my packet. And I basically put a layer around it where on the layer, it says that the packet is coming from me. And then I send it to the real destination. The real destination gets it, will reply to it hopefully and send it to me as the VPN provider because it thinks I'm the real person asking. I get it. I will then basically change the IP address again and send it back to you, right? So what happens is the server doesn't know your IP address. You got your information, but you, you never leaked your IP address. That's the basic idea. Um, so bang, IP redirection on demand and unrecorded then, basically. Um, so IP redirection is a word that basically says what I'm saying, but it's not the perfect word for it. Uh, basically I, uh, packet encapsulation. Instead of giving your packet, your nice true full packet, I put extra layer on it and make it look like it's from me. Um, and it helps me in being unrecorded, but now comes a problem. Um, and this is a question that we can combine with the one from Mac. If I'm a hacker and I hack a website using a VPN, the website doesn't know my IP address, but it knows the IP address of the, of the um, VPN provider, right? And they can look that up. A North VPN IP address is known, right? Um, so they'd be like, huh, someone hacked me and they used your service. And by law, in many, many countries, they can go to the VPN provider and say, tell me who did it. And a lot of VPN providers, and this is if you ever decide to get VPN, one thing you should look out for is whether they log, as a LOG, logging. Well, some of them will note down, okay, I got this packet from this person. I pretended to it to be my my packet, right? Um, they keep on doing this. So if you ever screw up and the police comes to me, I can tell them, oh, it's him. I, I did it for him, but it wasn't me, right? This is something you may not want, especially if you're a, um, a black hat hacker, right? Someone who's very evil and doesn't want to get caught. This is something you don't want, right? So you want a VPN service that doesn't use this. Furthermore, and this is something that Max said, can you use two VPNs to be more secure? Yes, you can. Um, so if you do it properly, you have many, many VPNs. 
um, like very, very, very properly. If you're very secure, like insanely, you as a, in the normal private person, you would never do this. You would have like five VPNs. First send it to this one, then to this one, then to this one. So by the time it arrives at the target, in order to trace back the steps, it would be such a hassle, maybe through five different countries, you know, who's going to go through all that trouble and look that up? That's how you can use VPNs to hide your IP address for whatever purpose you want. And for example, what you can do with something like NordVPN, they have these VPN stations everywhere in the world. Maybe there's a TV show you want to, uh, there's a TV show that you want to see, and that's in Brazil. But you can only do it with an IP address from Brazil. What you do is you get, for example, NordVPN, and you can choose which of the servers it has on the world it should route from. You choose the one in Brazil. So you send the packet to the one in Brazil. This one will make a request to Netflix. And because now it's this request is done by a Brazilian IP address, it will give the TV show back to you. So you can decide where it appears you're from. Okay. Um, can you explain? Wait, quick question, Bang. No law yet to enforce logging. Very, oh, I don't know that perfectly. There are, so there are VPNs that offer it without logging. Very few, it got less and less. Um, some countries it's enforced, some it isn't. Like for example, Switzerland is a country um, where I did my master's degree, where it's harder. They're much more privatized than that. Other countries are very easy. They're like, oh, you have to tell us everything, right? Um, big, this is a very interesting question. Is privacy good or is it bad? It helps the bad people, but it also helps people to be protected, you know? Um, so it's not enforced everywhere as of now. Um, so can you explain end-to-end -end encryption? End-to-end -end encryption, so if you know what encryption means, is basically hiding the, the message, right? So uh, very stupidly said, if I have a message I send to you, everybody can look at it and know what I say, say, right? What I can do is encrypt it with a key, is basically lock the message and no one can recognize what it means. And only you and me have the key. In this scenario, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, okay? Because the only person that can open this is me and you, the receiver and the sender. What is the alternative? For example, if you have WhatsApp, I think, maybe not WhatsApp, maybe Telegram, I know for sure. So Telegram, what it can do or may do, or like an instant messaging app, if you send a packet to your friend, instead of going directly there and being locked um, by you and this person, it's being locked by you and the, the instant messaging server. So you send it, it's encrypted, gets to the server, they open it, and then encrypt it again to send it to, to the other person, right? If you have this, this cut in the middle, then it's not end-to-end. End-to-end means it can't or it's not decrypted from the moment it's sent out to the moment it arrives at its final goal. That's end-to-end -end encryption. Okay? If you, last question, good, let's make this the last question. Maybe last question. <laughs> Does quantum computing change new protocols in the future? Oh, this has nothing to do with computer networks, but I'll give you a short answer, okay? So what it does change is cryptography. So cryptography deals with how we encrypt and decrypt things securely, right? So that no one can crack it, basically. Um, this is a very complex topic. I know nothing specific off, really, but I know some of it. Basically, com com quantum computer makes certain things which would take forever to do, much simpler, more realistic, right? If I had to guess a password that is 10 letters long, right? If it's a good password, it would take forever to go through all the possible combinations, let's say. Um, but if the promises that quantum computing makes um, are true, then um, basically this gets much, much easier. 
and then pro suddenly cryptography gets to be a problem. All the algorithms we used previously don't work anymore. So this is why the only problem with quantum computing, if it ever reaches the point that it's promised to be, is cryptography. Because some suddenly algorithms get easy to crack, but they already have solutions for that. They have new cryptographic systems, which are what they call quantum resistant. They are, even if quantum computing works the way it's supposed to, they're still safe. That's how quantum computing changes, I think, security in a sense. Angela, just want to say, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Of course, nice to read. Um, thanks. Colin, did you post the link to the slides? Um, so do you have the link to the exercises and to the, to the solution? Because that's where I also put the slides. But I can also share the slides like this if you want. So if you go on handouts in the top right, I hope there should be the slides that you can get. Thank you very much, then. Thanks for, again, thank you very much for coming. Um, it was really nice having you here. I had a blast talking about it. We'll be hosting more workshops in the future. If you are located in Germany, um, have a look at our website. I'll be hosting uh, um, an eight-hour in-person workshop about web security and um, capture the flag. So basic introduction to, um, to um, cyber security. Priyanka is doing a workshop too. Um, have a look, please. If you enjoyed the time with us, um, we will see each other again. I would have a good time. Um, thank you, Ben. That's very nice of you. <laughs> Animated presentation. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mark. I hope you have a good evening. Check out our other workshops, check out our application forum, and I hope to see you again, okay? Take care.